What do I mean by hope? My colleague Jeff Andrade Duncan, good friend of mine, uh, wrote a wonderful article in the Harvard Ed Review um, called Note to Educators, Hope Required When Growing Roses in Concrete. <laughs> and he says that there are really three types of hope. The first is a material hope, which is quality teaching that connects the harsh realities of, human, of the community conditions with new possibilities. How do we take what is in the classroom and in the neighborhood, in the, in the, in the uh, community, and bring that into the classroom? There's an ex uh, he gives an example of, of, uh, of a, uh, well actually a colleague of mine in Los Angeles tells a story about sh her driving up to a school in, in Los Angeles and seeing as she's driving up a child that had just been shot. And as the child was shot, they were pulling the yellow tarp over the child and then she gets into their classroom and it's testing day, standardized test. And so she asks her classroom to take out their pencils and they take out their pencils and they can't concentrate. They're, they're everywhere and they said, you didn't see what happened to Jerome's cousin? And she said, yeah, I saw that for today's testing day. And then she asked him to get the test out again, and she stopped because her humanity could not bear it anymore. She's a human first, a teacher second. And so she said, OK, class, I know what we're dealing with. I want you to take out your pencils, but I want you to write a letter to, Jerome's mo to uh, Gerard's mother. And they began to journal. And they began to share the stories about how, them, how they felt. And they began to talk about playing with him, uh, the, 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 uh, playing with Gerard. And they shared all these wonderful stories and they put it together and they sent that to them. Then that classroom project led, it led them to an activity where it taught them how to write. That led to a broader school newsletter that talked about community issues from the children's perspective. The point is, is that because she was able to connect and use this notion of material hope, she not only created a different kind of pedagogy, she actually was able to reach them in a different way. The second kind of hope he calls is Socratic hope. And that requires educators and students to painfully examine their own lives and actions to discover new ways of living. How is it that we begin to not see urban communities as places of pathology? I often talk about, you know, when we say the term Oakland, immediately we all have images of Oakland as violent, Images of Oakland is a not, not a safe place. Images of Oakland that are, are not places that we want to raise our children. But I live in Oakland, and I know the challenges of Oakland, and I've seen the horrifics of Oakland, but I also know the beauty. And oftentimes, we don't talk enough about the beauty. One of the things my son is doing now is, Terry, uh, is creating a counter-narrative of Oakland through, photo, for, through photography. Most of you don't know that if I showed you pictures of deer, if I showed you pictures of squirrels, if I actually showed you a, a, a picture of an elephant, right? you would think this is probably not Oakland. Yeah, this, there's an elephant, there are elephants in Oakland in the Oakland Zoo. But the point is, is that, that sometimes we need to have a counter narrative or, or a different way of expressing the realities, the harsh realities of urban life. And that by expressing and paying attention to what's good about our neighborhoods and what's good about our communities, we open up and rupture the sort of negative way of understanding our, our communities. And the last is audacious hope, which we're going to talk a little bit more today about, which is healing from op oppression in order to transform it. Oppression is not simply blocked opportunities. Oppression is, also has a consequence for our capacity to dream. Oppression is not simply the inability to have access to good schools. It's not simply the loss of jobs. It's not simply the exposure to violence. S oppression damages the spirit. And as educators, I think it's in incumbent upon us to figure out ways to allow for young people to heal from the exposure to oppression. So what are the threats to hope for young people? This is a picture of, of, of Oakland. And I want to introduce this, this concept by James Gabarino in a book called Raising Children in a Socially Toxic Environment. J Gabarino says that oftentimes we think about toxicity in terms of physical toxicity, which are lead paint and so on and so forth. But he also says there's social toxins. And social toxins are things like fear, 
anxiety and shame, all those types of things have just a lethal impact on young people and ourselves. These things have an individual consequence on young people. That is, stress, anxiety, young people experience, they bring it to the classroom. And that over time, these things have a damaging impact on young people's capacity to learn. Robin Kelly says the conditions of life, of, of everyday life and oppressions of survival render much of our imagination inert. We are constantly putting out fires, responding to emergencies, all which s seem to make life more difficult. But trauma and these things don't only exist in the individual level, they also happen at the institutional level. I was uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a couple, actually a couple uh, months ago, did a presentation for the Los Angeles Police Department. And I did the same talk and one of the police officers said, you know what, I, ac I actually can understand how trauma and these things have an impact on our whole department. Just earlier today, I did a call from young people. Uh, uh, I went to a call where a teenager had just robbed an 80-year-old woman. I went to the call, and she was laying on the ground. And I was so angry at that young man for doing that. Later on that day, I got a similar call in the same neighborhood. And when I went to that call, I took my anger out on those young people, not realizing that those were two separate incidences. Right? And that we don't have a way as police officers to step back and heal from those kinds of traumas that we see. Right? And so they're working on allowing and trying to provide opportunities for, for police officers to figure out how to heal from those things that they see. Over time, those things rupture our capacity to heal. If we're not able to figure out healing spaces in our classrooms and our community organizations, they have a toxic impact on ourselves and an imp toxic impact on our institutions. Virginia O'Leary, I think, has an interesting way of talking about this. She says that if we experience trauma, we, we, all, have, we all experience trauma. And when we experience it, we immediately uh, lose our normal level of functioning. It could be a loss of a loved one, could be a loss of a job, could be a loss of an opportunity, but we can't s simply sustain our normal level of functioning. And so what we just try to do is just survive, which is option A. We just try to make it through the day. Sometimes we can receive enough support that we can recover and get back to our normal level of functioning. We can have good youth development, we can have good uh, friends, and we recover and we can get back to where we were prior to the instance of, tr of that trauma. But the third option she calls thriving which is that we're actually at a higher functioning level than we were prior to the instance of trauma. And it is thriving that I think what we should be doing in our classrooms. Not simply teaching young people to survive, not simply teaching young people to recover, but creating an opportunity for young people to have a thriving environment. I'm running out of time. So, there's an experiment done that I think is a great metaphor for our classrooms. Here at UC Berkeley, or at UC Berkeley, a colleague of mine, was a microbiologist. She said they used to take these plants and they put them in these chambers and they would pump them with gas. And they'd essentially watch to find out, uh, watch the plant die. How long would it take and they would pump it with gas. But what they did was something different. They pulled uh, the same kind of plants, they pulled them together. And when they pulled those plants together, they pumped them with gas. But when they were together, they did something different. The plants began to pull out different nutrients out of the soil. They began to pull different kinds of ingredients out of the soil. And they began to emit their own gas that detoxified the very environment that they were in. They cleaned up the toxicity in their environment. And I think that that is the kind of environment we want to create for our young people. We want to create what I call a radical healing. We want to create an opportunity for young people to begin to clean up the toxicity in their lives to clean up the kind of issues that they see in their neighborhoods and communities. Um, what does it look like in schools? What does a radical healing process look like in a classroom or a community-based organization? Um, there are, in my book, Black Youth Rising, I name four. We might prob we'll probably get through two today. So the first is, we've heard today, which is caring relationships. The second, which is profound community connections. The third is a consciousness of these conditions. And the third is not an unapologetic rootedness in culture. Let me go to 
this interesting book I just read by Martin Sigelman uh, called Flourish. He was the president of the American Psychological Association, and he was tired of studying pathology, and I am too, which is why I read his book. And he said, I want to do something different. Rather than teaching people how to become less um, stressed, less anxious, I want to teach people how to become happy, to experience joy, to experience peace and optimism. He asked a question, a basic question in his book, and he asked this to parents, in one or two words, what do you want most for your children? Just think about that. And the parents began to say, I want fulfillment and happiness and continent and balance and health and I want my children to be happy, which is what we all want. Then he asked the same question, or a similar question, he said, in one or two words, um, what do schools teach? <laughs> Math, work, test taking, discipline, success, right? All of, and there is no overlap, right? What we want for our children is not actually reinforced in schools. How do we begin to teach what it is we want to see? This is an example of a caring relationship. And I actually have to move, move past this because I'm out of time. But I was working at a school in San Francisco. They brought me in. The school was dysfunctional. I walked into the classroom. The, the kids, and the, I've never seen a school like this. There were six kids in each classroom with two teachers. It was amazing. And the two teachers couldn't handle the six kids. And there was, there was only like 80 kids in the school. I walked in, the kids are throwing paper, they're yelling and screaming, they're using profanity, all these bad, bad things. I go into the next classroom, see the same thing, go into the next classroom to say the same thing. Passing period. And as I'm walking back to the office to tell the principal, I can't deal with this, I can't, do, I can't help your school. I mean, it's a bigger issue than just a motivational speaker. I walk into her classroom. <laughs> So I walked into her classroom, Ms. Johnson's classroom. The same kids that I saw earlier were in her classroom, and they were sitting down quiet. They were doing what they're supposed to do. I said, Ms. Johnson, how come they're not cussing each other out? And she said, oh, child, they're not going to do that, because Jimmy right there, I told his mama, I'll tell his mama if I see him. And Cindy, I told Cindy, if she doesn't sit down well, I, at church, I'm going to tell her grandmama to not. And so she began to name all of her relationships. Now, she wasn't calling them profound, caring relationships, but she had relationships outside of the context of the classroom that translated to a caring, profoundly humane relationship to the young people in the classroom. She was able to provide a sense of hope and a sense of imagination that they hadn't seen before in a teacher. I'm going to move past um, a couple of slides because I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. But we thought it would be interesting to to what would, it, what would it be like if we taught teachers in Oakland how to train happiness, how to train joy, not teaching you the latest curriculum, but, but to, to instill a sense of joy in yourself and transmit that to young people. So we were able to raise a little bit of money and we had a retreat in October of this year with African American teachers and community organizers and community uh, people who work in community organizations, youth workers. And we didn't train, we didn't talk about skill sets. We talked, we wanted to focus on joy. We wanted to focus on happiness. And so we danced. We shared our childhood, our dreams. We shared all the kinds of things we never talk about in teacher trainings but have a most profound impact when we teach. And so we wanted, we're going to meet again and we're going to research how, does the, how do these practices ha translate into the classroom and what kind of impact do these practices have on young people. I'm going to move, move past this and end with a quote by Dr. King that I think he captures and he knows this profoundly. He says that one of the greatest problems of history is that the concepts of love and power have usually been contrasted as opposites. And what is needed is the realization that power without love is reckless and abusive. And that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice, at its best, is power correcting everything that stands against love. Thank you very much.